From Sanatha Jones's lust and sex in the city to Jude Law's portrayal of the young pope, and now to the Gilded Age, the high-end cabler-turned-streamer has honored the unique form of longing that clergy members can arouse. For example, Ada and Reverend Matthew Fort have quickly embraced the world of stealthy glances and subdued handshakes since his arrival on the Gilded Age this season. But if you're anticipating a slow-burning, Victorian-era romance novel-style affair, you should reconsider. After only a few episodes we're already in, going straight to the proposal of marriage. Why does it make me laugh so much to see a prim and nice, tight corseted woman lose it all and have a total meltdown? Bertha Russell has demonstrated this repeatedly, Aunt Anne's has turned her zinger-filled tantrums into an art form, and now Mrs. Winterton may have thrown the worst tantrum of them all. A sulky stomping up the stairs, meltdown that borders on petty perfection. How fitting to wrap up an episode. As soon as Mrs. Winterton Turner, whose first name is in it, arrived, fantastic to hear, returned to the Russell family during the Gilded Age, you could be certain that she was laying the groundwork for a major drama to ensue. I can't stop questioning myself if Turner had a crush on Bertha from the beginning, even before she made an attempt to woo George Russell. Or is it possible that she simply observed Bertha as she slipped into high society while working as her lady's maid, and now she's vying to become the most fascinating and influential new lady in town? This week's episode opens with Mrs. Winterton seeing the new opera house with Bertha, Aurora Fane, Kelly O'Hara, and a few other wealthy individuals who are inquisitive about the Met. Bertha is still attempting to persuade the Fanes and the Wintertons to obtain a box at the Metropolitan, but it turns out that she needs their financial assistance more than just their moral support because the building's construction has come to a standstill. Bertha is informed by Mr. Gilbert, Jeremy Shamos, that he fears they won't be able to begin the season on schedule, endangering the entire idea of going up against the Academy of Music directly. Mrs. Winterton is merely attempting to shove her new position in Bertha's face and dish out cold, heartbreaking insults while she's at it. She's not there to offer any type of assistance. However, it is not the least of Bertha's concerns this week. The true source of her distress is her son Larry and the gossip going about Newport that he has been having an affair with the attractive widow Mrs. Susan Blaine, Laura Benanti. Bertha is asked her opinion on the blind item that links Larry and Mrs. Blaine by a gilded age 10 as a reporter. Although Bertha rules out romance, she is incensed that Larry's liaison would become so widely known and so scandalous. Bertha invites Susan Blaine to her house for a conversation because she feels differently than George Russell about her son's romantic life, who merely wants his daughter to find real love and happiness. Bertha had indicated that she wanted to talk about Mrs. Blaine's support of the Met, but she doesn't waste time revealing that she really tricked Mrs. Blaine into being there and that she just wants to make sure Blaine doesn't back down from Larry. Although Larry and Mrs. Blaine have been having fun together, while playing around Mrs. Blaine's sheets all summer, their relationship is more than just a passing fancy. They have declared their love for one another. Bertha doesn't hold back when she questions Mrs. Blaine's age, asking bluntly, What is it that you want from him? He cannot have an heir. He'll be using a stick to walk when he's at his best, which will be in 20 years. Remember what it was like when you were married to your husband, even if he feels too guilty to leave. Part of him will be waiting for you to die, Bertha says. Bertha doesn't feel sorry for herself because she's just getting started this week when it comes to steamrolling over the women of New York. Susan, shocked and incensed by the callousness, leaves. Ad is aware that Angs disapproves, but she has been getting more and more involved with the Reverend. After he gives Ada a bouquet of peonies, Ada says, I don't have the strength to explain them to Agnes, and asks Marion to look after them. Agnes is aware that Ada is being sly, but during dinner, she explains to her sister why she finds the thought of Ada falling in love so offensive. She says to Ada, It would seem a poor return after all these years if you were to desert me now. And as the evening goes on, things get more awkward until the bell really saves them. Now lay John's alarm clock, which he has been fiddling with, finally sounds, breaking the tension for the time being. Ada is not the only resident of Van Ryan, though, to discover love. Dashiell Montgomery, David Four, is a difficult person for Marion to let go of. At a school tea, she's eager to play the role of motherly figure to Dashiell's daughter Frances. But when Frances says that the three of them create a neat little family unit, it gets awkward. Frances, I see you parent trapping. Marion had always been receptive to getting to know Dashiell, but when Frances says this, you can't help but get a hint of resistance from her. However, now that Larry and Susan Blaine are no longer together, even though it wasn't their choice, Marion and Larry could at last pursue whatever former romance they had. 
Oscar too, has discovered Maud Beaton, Nicole Brydenbloom, a lady who could offer him appropriate companionship. Oscar is devoting all of his focus to Maud since she is worldly, wealthy, and enjoys his company, so much so that Gladys Russell isn't even featured in this episode. Oscar is genuinely shocked to see Mrs. Winterton at the dinner honoring the Duke of Buckingham, which the Russells and the Wintertons are also attending. You have till the next course to explain your ascension, he informs her, recalling that she was Turner the lady's maid the last time he saw her. I adore how Oscar and Turner have a special friendship in which they manage to find common ground despite all of the social differences on the program. Even if their connection was transactional at first, they appear to be very similar people. Bertha extends an invitation to the Duke to remain with her at Newport, since it turns out that he much prefers her company than that of the Wintertons. Though staying with the Wintertons was already in his plans, it feels like much more fun to bed with Bertha. What will Mrs. Winterton think of all this? Bertha wonders George, who she has now forgiven for failing to inform of Turner's one and only appearance in his bed while naked. The Duke is going to be their guest. Or are you indifferent? Should I care about the feelings of a former lady's maid who attempted to seduce my husband? Asks Bertha, the quintessential Bertha. To serve as a little reminder that the Gilded Age did not only exist among the wealthy in New York, Peggy, Denny Benton, and her boss T. Thomas Fortune, Sullivan Jones, are visiting Booker T. Washington this week in Alabama. The trip is not without peril, as 1883 Alabama is not as progressive as 1883 New York, and it stirs up a lot of bitterness for Fortune, who was once a slave himself. Fortune and Washington quarrel over the fact that black people enslaved to his institution, the Tuskegee Institute, are only being taught manual labor skills that are lowly in comparison to those of white people. Fortune questions Washington on how he can live and conduct business with the same white people who bought and sold us, to which Washington responds that he must play nice in order to avoid being assassinated. The dinner is unpleasant and tense, despite Peggy's best efforts to defuse the situation, and Fortune remains unmoved by what Washington is attempting to accomplish for Alabama's black community. Even though we've already seen a lot of Mrs. Winterton, it was exciting to see Mr. Winterton appear on TV. After being invited to Mrs. Astor's residence, Mr. Winterton, played by Dakin Matthews, who I know best from Gilmore Girls as Headmaster Charleston, learns that his membership in the Academy has been cancelled due to the background of his new bride. It remains to be seen how Mrs. Astor discovered this knowledge, cough, Bertha Russell. However, it also acts as a wake-up call for Mr. Winterton, who is stunned to find out that his wife has a background and inspires him to support Bertha's opera theater. Mrs. Astor is informed by Mr. Winterton that he will gladly join the Met crowd at this time, bringing along all of his old, wealthy acquaintances. When Mr. Winterton confronts his wife about the hazy information Mrs. Astor gave him regarding her previous employment, she responds that she used to be Mrs. Russell's companion because that was a thing in the past. She doesn't ever admit to being a lady's maid. At the end of the episode, all of New York finds out that Bertha Russell is going to welcome the Duke of Buckingham at her Newport estate and throw a dinner in his honor. The news is so significant that it makes the headlines. The Wintertons, however, were unaware of this and believed they were hosting the Duke. Mr. Winterton grins and adds, perhaps we'll be invited, as Mrs. Winterton shakes with anger after reading the news. When Mrs. Winterton tosses her newspaper into the flames, her husband advises her not to get too worked up. She cries, I will upset myself, to him. If it's my last act, I will cause Mrs. George Russell distress. Done. Other dukes will exist. As she storms up her home's stairs in rage, I wish not to have another duke. She has just finished taking the course how to react when you don't get your way at the Veruca Salt School of Entitlement, and she exclaims, I want this duke. When Kelly Kern exclaims, this is comedy gold, her voice cracks a little. We found him, and I own him. But that witch took him away from me. She runs out as the episode ends and it appears as though she might break the fourth wall and stare at us as well. It would be nice if she did. All I can say about this moment is that it's pure perfection, a masterful summation of all the lovely small-minded shenanigans that give this show its high drama.